This will be the second installment of CastNet's political forum here. This will be for the Kelowna Mission Riding. I'd like to welcome all of our candidates that were able to make it out today. To my left here, we have Mike McLaughlin representing the Conservative Party, Daleen Van Ryswick running as an independent, Tish Lakes with the NDP, and at the end, we have Steve Thompson with the Liberal Party. He's also the incumbent. This will run the same way as the first form. Everybody will get two minutes to talk about themselves before we run into the Q&A session. We'll start with Mike. Thanks very much. My name is Mike McLaughlin. I'm the BC Conservative candidate for Kelowna Mission. BC Conservatives are all about fiscal responsibility. We want to uh, bring fair taxation back to British Columbia. We want to re restore the justice system. We want to support agriculture. We want to uh, provide 10 new special prosecutors to go after organized crime. We are the honest and accountable alternative for government in British Columbia. Thank you. And moving on to Daleen. Hi, my name is Daleen Van Ryswick, and I'm a business owner here in Kelowna. Uh, on April 16th, I was made an example of by today's Liberals. I made some comments four years ago that the Liberals used an attempt to stop my political career. The way that it was handled was completely unnecessary. A decent government would have suggested I resign or they would have outed me. But they chose not to do that. They preferred a much more public smear campaign. Keep in mind that this is the same government that spent over a year hatching a plan to scheme ethnic community out of votes in the ever repugnant quick win ethnic scandal. Which is now followed by comments from Grand Chief Stuart Phillip the other day where he said the province did a tour through the province this spring and were handing out agreements like gum sticks for that very reason, attempting to enhance the relationship and positions with First Nations people, hoping somehow that would translate into votes. They've shown that they will do anything and to say anything to get votes, no matter how unethical. Today's Liberals aren't the same Liberals that you remember. Those Liberals have been replaced by ones okay with quick win ethnic scandals, using pri private email accounts to avoid FOI investigations, and fanciful balanced budgets coupled with a prosperity fund sprinkled in fairy dust. It could be said, and some people have said, that the Liberals who left did so because they wouldn't be part of how the Liberals were being led under Christy Clark. I've been told repeatedly that there's a lot of unhappy Liberals with nowhere to put their vote, and they refuse to vote for Ms. Clark, and they can't force themselves to vote for the NDP, and they're not interested in the Conservatives. As an independent, I am not bound by party policy, and I don't have a party whip telling me how to vote or what to say. Your voice is my voice, and I am the only one who can give you a truly independent voice in the legislature. And if you've learned nothing more about me in the last few weeks than the fact that I am accountable, I am straightforward and I'm not afraid to stand up and be heard. I could have shrunk away from being beaten down by the liberal machine, but I have integrity and fortitude and stayed with the game. Thank you. And moving on to Tish. I'm Tish Lakes. I'm running for the BC NDP in Kelowna Mission. Um, our party has come forward with a fully costed platform so that when we become government, we can be transparent, we can present some clear options for the whole province and some good things for the Okanagan. I personally have uh, had the opportunity to work in both rural and urban communities in BC. I just have a tremendous appreciation for the people and, and the place that we live. It's a magnificent place and I have no problem being inspired to work for BC. Here in Kelowna, I've worked with service providers. I've worked up front because what happens is people come and they have problems with government and I help them solve the problems. And so I see up front when services work well, how services can work well. I see people working to try and make government better. And I also have a close-up view as to how services can improve. And I think one of the important jobs for your MLA is to be that conduit. I think the people on the ground who are receiving services, whether it's uh, something to do with your business, whether it's health care, education, social services, whatever it is, it's the people on the ground receiving those services and the frontline people who have the best voices how they should work and what your MLA needs 
MLA needs to do is to facilitate the communication so that Victoria is always informed. And I've actually had the opportunity to work with some high-level bureaucrats in Victoria who are doing actually that. They're actually reaching out to the grassroots. And I really can't think of any better way to solve problems. So I'm sure over the course of tonight we'll be able to talk about uh, what we're doing for agriculture, for education, all the specifics in answer to your question. Um, I think this is a case of change for the better or more of the same. And uh, we look forward to serving you well as government. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Steve. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody, and all those uh, listening. And uh, thanks to Cassinet for, uh, for organizing this forum. Uh, my name is Steve Thompson. I'm the candidate for the BC Liberal Party. I was uh, born and raised here in this riding. Our family came here in 1896. Uh, settled here in, in farming, and we're still farming the same property out in the uh, out in the flats in the mission that uh, we settled on in 1896. Um, I've had the real honor and privilege of being able to represent this riding for the last uh, four years, both in government and as a as a minister, minister of agriculture and minister of forest lands and natural resource operations. I really uh, care deeply about this riding. Uh, one of the motivations for uh, for running is to continue to be able to uh, serve. Uh, this riding and this community. I have eight uh, great reasons for uh, for running again. That's three ch three children and, and eight grandchildren, and I want to make sure that I can continue to provide a strong future and a strong economy for them and for all of you. Uh, we've worked very hard on your behalf over the last four years. Uh, one of the most rewarding parts of this job has been to serve uh, the people of the riding through our constituency office, solving uh, many of those problems. Probably one of the great privileges is of doing this job. We've worked very effectively here as a team, along with uh, Norm Letnick and Ben Stewart. Uh, the work that uh, was started by the Liberals in, in 2001, we've continued to build on, bringing over $1.5 billion in, uh, in key investments uh, in our riding, addressing the priorities of our riding. Uh, that's included investments in health care, in education, in the great institutions at UBC Okanagan and Okanagan College, uh, transportation, affordable housing. Uh, so we want to uh, continue that work. We've consulted with our constituents on the key priorities going forward, uh, increased services at uh, KGH, a new uh, middle school in, uh, in the upper mission in, in our riding, ongoing investments in transportation. All of that's going to depend on ensuring that we have a, a strong economy, an economy that's focused on responsible uh, resource development, one that's going to help provide the framework that's going to allow us to uh, make those investments and to continue to service the needs of the uh, great constituents we have here in Kelowna Mission. Thank you. All right, our viewers now have a basic idea of where you guys all stand, so let's just get right into it now. Um, obviously, you have all uh, had a little chance to get out, do some door knocking, get to know some of your constituents. So what, is, what do you feel is the most important issue in the, in the Kelowna Mission riding, and what have you heard from the people? We'll start with Daylene. Uh, well, what I've heard from some people is uh, concern about our water, and so with the issues that's facing West or East Kelowna, sorry, in their water district is something that's uh, of great importance to the people in our constituency. Uh, honestly, in our constituency, that's a lot of the same issues that you find all across the province and their education and jobs and uh, the environment, agriculture, all those sorts of things. Um, for me, I think that it is a fact that they've only sat 47 days in the legislature last year. So that means that all these issues that are important to people in our constituency are not being heard. And that is your democratic right to have that. And I find that the Liberals are just throwing our democracy completely out the window by not at least even sitting in the legislature to discuss these things that are of, of great importance to everybody around the province, not just in our constituency. So it's, uh, I think democracy is probably our biggest thing and the lack thereof. Moving on to Tish. It's hard to pick one. I'm going to pick sustainable economy uh, as a theme. So we look at things like Buy BC, Grow BC, the NDP programs, and the fact that our orchardists want to be able to continue. Um, we also look at the future for our children, the idea that children who live in the Okanagan as they grow up should be able to get solid education here, good support through our college and university, and be able to move into jobs that pay well. So the skills training, the apprenticeship is not only good for those young people, but it's also good for business because we know that there's an issue with skill shortages. Um, and I believe that we can work to, for the economy and the environment. So when we look at issues like water, um, again, with our farming industry, with other things, 
and with forestry and even with mining and all those other things, I do believe that we can work together to make it that we work combined efforts with the environment and the economy, not in competition. Steve, most important topic. Thanks. So, um, also heard the concerns about water, and uh, but I won't uh, reiterate those. Uh, it's one we're hearing on the doorsteps. But what I'm primarily hearing when I'm being out uh, meeting in the neighborhoods and on the doorsteps is, first of all, appreciation for uh, for the work that we've done and the and the investments that we've made in this community and being able to bring to this community, and the uh, direction that they want to see a strong economy. Uh, based on on the principles that we have in our budget, with a balanced budget, with uh, with low uh, lowest personal rates of uh, tax in uh, in in the country, uh, they want to continue that, being able to keep the dollars in uh, in their pockets, and to be able to have an economy, a sustainable economy, a balanced one, that uh, provides for the revenues and the services and and uh, and jobs in this community, that we can continue to make those kind of investments uh, here in the future, and that's uh, that's the message that I've been hearing on. On the doorstep is uh, thanks for everything you've done and uh, make sure that you keep up the good work yeah, don't let the door hit you and Mike what have you been hearing people can't find a family doctor my wife is a family doctor we have the Medi-Cal clinics and uh, right now we have 7,500 patients that are registered on our roster at the Medi-Cal clinics that actually don't have a family family doctor they are seeing us uh, on a walk-in basis people can't find family doctors last year in in 2012 over 20 family doctors either left practice or left the community because they had better offers outside of this community. We are in a crisis regarding the physician supply and family doctors just are not available. He, even here in Kelowna, it's very difficult to re recruit them to this community. We do have a medical school. That is happening. That is a good thing. The problem is, is that the number of uh, physicians that they're training, of the 32 physicians that they're training, the, the first class through, only six are choosing family medicine. So we have a crisis when regards to uh, recruiting and retaining our family physicians. And that's something I am in particularly impassioned about and I want to take to Victoria. Thank you. Many cities like Kelowna, uh, they tend to rely on small businesses uh, as our lifeblood. Uh, what is the message that each of you have for the mom-and-pop stores of Kelowna and what would you do for them if elected? This time we'll start with Tish. Well, we're going to keep the small business tax stable. Um, we need to make sure that we've got an economy and that means that people have available money to spend. So that means even things like a housing initiative, which you might not think of with business right away, will help because when you have so many families in this area paying a very substantial portion of their income for housing, it means they cannot be consumers. It means that as we look at seriously at the skills training and seriously at having well-paying jobs, again, we've got consumers. I think our small businesses need to have people in the community who can support them because people want to support businesses and that means we've got to have sustainable jobs for people so that we've got that body of people who will be happy here in the Okanagan. Well, uh, very, very good question. Thank you. The, uh, the small businesses in our in our province, as you know, 98% of, uh, of businesses are small businesses. They create about 56% of uh, private sector jobs, 29% of our, our provincial uh, GDT, GDP. And in the o Thompson Okanagan here, uh, we've led small business growth since 2001, 7.3% increase in, uh, in this region. Um, it, our uh, platform calls for uh, continued uh, uh, low uh, small business tax rates and a commitment to uh, reduce the current small business tax rate uh, from 2.5% to 1.5%, down 40% uh, in the next few years, at least uh, half, half a percent of that, 0.5% by 2016. Uh, we are going to continue to focus on red tape reduction. We're the only province that got an A from the Canadian Federation of Indi Independent Business for reducing uh, regulations, and that's one of the key messages I've heard from small businesses is to remove the uh, the regulatory burden and we'll we uh, keep a focus on that we have a legislative requirement to report on on that and uh, we're going to uh, reduce the barriers to uh, procurement government procurement for small business by reducing the uh, by streamlining the RFP process for them moving on to Mike okay so uh, the Liberals promised to eliminate the small business tax by 2011 and that uh, did not happen uh, so it's a little rich for me to for me to hear that they are going to they are going to eliminate the small business tax. Either you do it or you don't. Uh, 
So I think that uh, small businesses, uh, like many people on limited income, uh, suffer from having to pay the carbon tax. BC Conservatives would eliminate the carbon tax. Carbon tax is a regressive tax. That means that it hits people of lower income harder than it does people of higher income, especially in the interior and uh, in the north. It's difficult for people to, uh, to take advantage of some of the transit and some of the other initiatives that you see in the lower mainland from uh, um, TransLink, et cetera. So I think that if we eliminated the carbon tax, that would provide uh, relief to uh, small businesses. They wouldn't have to pay that additional burden. And they would be more competitive with uh, businesses outside of the province that aren't paying the carbon tax. We're the only jurisdiction in Canada and in North America that, that has a carbon tax. So that makes us less competitive. You want to help small businesses get rid of the carbon tax. I'm a small business owner. And in 2009, the Liberal government, in their last election promises, promised to make our small business taxes zero. Um, and that was April 2012. <laughs> it was supposed to happen. Okay. But it hasn't. And now they're promising to take it from 2.5% to 1.5%. Um, they make an awful lot of promises that they don't keep. And uh, they make a lot of promises right around election time. So you can take that for what it's worth. But I'll tell you right now, the HST, when that was dumped on small business, was not any doing anything for red tape, that's for sure. Uh, I just enjoyed, a, what, a um, few weeks ago, putting my tills back all to GST and PST. The cost that it has been to small business with this HST fiasco has been a nightmare, and it's been um, certainly not a pleasant thing to go through, and that was courtesy of the Liberal government. Thank you. Uh, we're going to switch gears here. We've just gotten in a message on Twitter from Tim Krupa. What will you do to close socioeconomic gaps between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples? We'll begin with Steve Thompson. Thanks. Well, uh, we've uh, had a very um, focused process in terms of working with First Nations and building capacity and, and economic opportunities for, for First Nations all across the province uh, through the, uh, through the new, new relationship. Uh, focus on uh, completing new treaties, uh, seven new treaties. Uh, also looking at a process of what we call um, interim treaty agreements and uh, economic development agreements uh, with uh, with First Nations to help them build the capacity to participate in in resource uh, development. We uh, we will continue to focus on that because that's uh, what we're uh, we're hearing across the province is making sure that they are are participants in in the uh, in the resource uh, activity in the province and those agreements both uh, with interim agreements, uh, economic development agreements, uh, forest uh, revenue uh, sharing agreements with First Nations are all helping uh, helping do that uh, across the province and we're seeing great uh, great support and participation in those uh, in those initiatives. Moving on to Mike. So yeah, First Nations communities are very valuable communities within uh, the province of British Columbia, and we need to uh, involve them in the, all of the different opportunities that we have here in the province for economic development. So uh, we support the no Northern Gateway Pipeline, and the Northern Gateway Pipeline is an uh, economic development project that would benefit First Nations communities in the north. They would be the ones that would be supplying jobs uh, that, or the supplying workers to the jobs. They would be the ones that would uh, benefit from having um, uh, partnerships with the companies that, uh, that would be doing business in that communities, in those communities to put the pipeline through. Uh, and that would be a significant benefit for them in the north. So I think uh, as a BC Conservative, if we need to develop our resource economy here in British Columbia and we need to share that wealth with all of British Columbia, including First Nations communities. Moving on to Daylene. I think a lot of people have been forgotten about with the Liberal government, and it's not just First Nations, it is um, the middle class as well, which is fighting a war on survival. Um, when all this broke loose about me in some comments that I made online, it was to do with First Nations. And they were taken out of context because I had said that uh, I thought First Nations issues hadn't been dealt with fairly, and I still agree with that. Um, it's been a bit of a hotbed issue for sure, but I think you can't uh, deal with these issues if people are afraid to talk about it. So as, a, as an independent, that makes me an advocate for the people in the Kelowna Mission. And if this is a big issue, First Nations issues with people in the Kelowna Mission, then I'm happy to, to address that. 
we aren't going to get anywhere in this country if we don't sit down and start talking to each other and talking about the really hard, tough questions that uh, might be uncomfortable. But we need to talk about it because it's, it's making a very deep divide in this country. And Tish? It was the NDP in the 90s that made significant moves towards treaty negotiation and resolution because we've got to have that for the sake of uh, stability and for economic development in the province of British Columbia. And that will bring us forward to addressing both the environmental needs and the economic needs and being partners with First Nations. Uh, we've had clear examples here in the Okanagan of First Nations being able to organize, get themselves forward and get things going. Um, we also know that there's a lot of First Nations communities that need significantly greater help because they've been left behind. We specifically said in our training programs we will target all youth and there will be components for First Nations and for women. So we have a good relationship and a good basis, I think, to work with First Nations and so that the province can move together as a whole. Thank you. Job skills training is something we've heard a lot about recently uh, because as the world advances, skills continually need to be upgraded in order to keep pace. What do you think is the best way to tackle the task of ensuring new and current workers are up to date and able to meet labor needs? We'll begin with Mike. So we have a system in British Columbia that is a supply uh, system of education. That is that uh, we have colleges, we have uh, training uh, programs, we have universities, and they uh, invite students to apply for different programs and they graduate those students from those programs and so they're supplying those uh, students to the market. The challenge is, is that in our changing market environment, is that it's much more of a demand situation where the market and various different industries have skills demands. And those, uh, those uh, skills aren't necessarily being supplied by the, uh, the current system. So we need to uh, revisit how we do skills training. We need to work in partnership with industry and uh, the marketplace to uh, develop programs where uh, students and uh, job seekers can apprentice in industry and Industry can help provide them the skills. Industry can pay for them to be educated in those skills. And that, therefore, industry gets the skilled workers that they need. That uh, approach would be, I think, more effective than uh, just simply graduating a, a class of students and expecting industry to hire them. Daylene? Well, industry is telling us that we have an 80% jobs of tomorrow will need some sort of skills training. And our apprenticeship, apprenticeship completion rates have dropped to 35 percent under the Liberals. Uh, I, I suggest that we increase apprenticeship programs. We encourage that. And skills training obviously is a very important thing. Um, it's estimated that between 2010 and 2020 that the demand for skills, skilled workers will outplay, outpace supply by 61,000 workers. And relying on foreign workers to fill those jobs when we should be training our people here uh, is ridiculous. We, um, we are jobs without people and people without jobs, and that needs to change. Tish? I agree that the apprenticeship program, program has suffered, and the fact is in the past we've had great apprenticeship programs in BC, and we've had great training programs. So part of what we need is do a little bit of going back to the future and restoring that. We need two things. We can do specialized training and, and partner with business to do that, but there's no substitute for the solid skill base. The advantage when you go through your apprenticeship is that you get a range of skills. And we do not have the situation where you can go work for, say, Tech Kamenko and you can go work for the mill for the rest of your life. Young people now are expecting to be able to move from place to place in British Columbia, and that's why they need a solid base of solid skills training. And that, of course, we've got the college here. Um, all the things that we're going to do to enhance apprenticeship and trades training can only help the college, and I think we're going to see good things for BC. I also think that as far as immigration go, bring people in to stay here rather than temporarily. Thanks. Good, good question. And 
it, it is a, a critical uh, need for the future, uh, as I've worked in the, particularly in the resource sector with the, with the ministry that I'm responsible for meeting with the resource companies around the province. The identified uh, skills needs and gap uh, that is there in the future is one that is probably one of their, their biggest uh, uh, constraints and one of the biggest things they need, challenges they need to deal with uh, going forward. We've invested uh, $500 million annually in, the, uh, in skills training and development programs. Uh, we've recently uh, committed $75 million to upgrade training and equipment uh, in, the, in, uh, in institutions across the province. We need to continue to make sure we're, we're uh, training on the most up-to-date uh, equipment. Uh, we need to work uh, effectively with partnerships between industry and uh, and the educational institutions to make sure that we have the uh, the right skills uh, training as the as the students and apprentices come out of the uh, out of the programs. Uh, there's going to be about one million job openings uh, coming up in the next uh, uh, by 2020. 43 percent of that uh, in the uh, in the skilled trades. So clearly one that is going to require a focused uh, effort and one that will require uh, strong partnerships between industry between educational institutions and the provincial government. Thank you. This next question kind of follows up. It has to do with jobs and at least job training possibly in the future. Uh, it's no secret that in the Okanagan, the orchard industry is very large. Um, there's been talk about the genetically modified organisms. Are you in favor of GMOs? Why or why not? We'll start with Daylene. Uh, no, I'm not in favor of GMOs. I am a vegetarian and I like to eat a lot of organic food and GMOs definitely contradict uh, organic gardening. In fact, uh, it will probably bring an end to that. Um, when you have all these genetic modified organisms, uh, it is, um, it's changing the food that we eat and we need to, to keep it not with genetic modified organisms, obviously. And we see that in the salmon too, you see, with the farming and um, I'm a firm believer on doing things organic and just leaving Mother Nature alone, and I don't support GMOs. Tish? We're able to produce some great new apples without having to use uh, GMO products. Uh, the ambrosia is one of my favorites here in the Okanagan. Speaking directly to farmers, one of the things that is happening in our agriculture is that there's specialty and niche markets happening. We have to protect the integrity of those markets, and there's a clear issue with GMOs. And our farming community is going to be very upset with that if we don't yeah. protect the integrity. The federal and provincial NDP have strongly supported in favor of consumer laboring, labeling. Uh, we know there's products entering through the food chain. Um, there is serious questions in the public mind about testing. And again, one of the examples of what the NDP has done with respect to testing is preserving the therapeutics initiative, which is a different program. Again, the concept that as we're moving forward, we have to support the idea of independent transparent testing for both GMOs and a lot of the environmental things that are going on. Steve? Thanks. This is a, an issue that is uh, under federal jurisdiction in terms of decisions uh, around uh, the definition around labeling. Uh, we have, uh, and I've talked extensively with, uh, with the Fruit Growers Association and other growers uh, on, with respect to their concerns around the uh, uh, the current proposals, uh, we've communicated those concerns to the uh, federal minister, and um, and I know that uh, Norm Letnick, as uh, minister of agriculture, has has communicated directly uh, to the federal minister and all uh, all provincial ministers uh, on this. It, it is important to uh, make sure that uh, the definition is understood, uh, to support the idea of labeling. Uh, but uh, again, that we need to make sure that we continue to work and have a strong, positive working relationship with the uh, with the federal government as the uh, as the decisions are made. Uh, the federal minister certainly understands the uh, uh, the concerns uh, from this area and from uh, from our uh, growers association and or organic growers. And Mike, yes, I'm against uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms in our food chain uh, and I think especially here in the Okanagan with the agricultural industry and the fruit growing industry we need to uh, stick with what we've got and it's a, it's a great product. Um, we have a family um, urban garden and we grow vegetables for our community. Uh, we sell them out, the, out of our gate um, and uh, if we had uh, genetically mod modified organisms that uh, were passed uh, into our, uh, we wouldn't no, we wouldn't be able to tell people that we were actually uh, providing them organically grown food. Uh, so uh, it's a 
I think a concern to many, many people here in the Okanagan, and I, I think uh, uh, all of the, uh, us uh, po politicians here in the Okanagan should be against genetically modified organisms. Thank you. We're going to switch gears a little bit now, move into education. It's always a hot topic around elections and whether it's a shortage of teachers or the call for lower tuition fees for college students. We'd like to know what would you say to students or teachers that watch this? We'll start with Tish. Well, when it comes to um, early childhood education, let's start from the beginning. Uh, we're going to lower the fees by $2,000 a year uh, for infant and toddler care. We're going to create more child care spaces. Um, in grade school, we said we'll restore some of the cuts and introduce a thousand new positions because there are problems with class size and there are problems with the loss of special assistance for kids with special needs and we really have to fix that. Teachers need us to be clear to do that we're going to do something about that. Um, as far as university and again training goes, um, we will reintroduce the non-repayable student grant program. I got the benefit of that when I was going through university I think this generation that is facing a tougher job market should get that same advantage and it will pay off. For one thing, as students graduate with less consumer debt, again, they're going to be able to be better consumers. Um, and then I've already mentioned the skills training and I'm, I'm getting a wrap, so I'll end it there. <laughs> Thanks, on, Steve. Steve. Sorry. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the investment that we make in, um, in education is probably one of the most critical investments we can make because we're investing in our, in our children and in our, uh, in our, in our future. Uh, we've, in the Okanagan here with the investments we've been able to make in our, in our institutions with, uh, with UBC Okanagan and Okanagan College, building that uh, capacity. When you look at the vision that was started a number of, uh, a number of years ago to first uh, bring forward the idea of a, a of a world leading uh, university uh, institution here in 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 Kelowna, uh, going from 3,000 students to now over 8,000 students uh, uh, registered uh, to be able to make that investment so that students can can study here uh, closer to home and and uh, and stay at home, uh, reducing their costs. Uh, we need to make sure that we continue to invest in those uh, in those facilities. Uh, we have capped tuition fees at uh, at uh, two percent. Uh, we need to look as uh, as we go uh, forward. We have lots of provisions around the student loan uh, repayments, uh, and as the uh, as we build the economy and create additional jobs and revenue, uh, then we need in the future to look at uh, at aspects of the uh, of the student loan program uh, when we have the financial ca capacity to be able to uh, be able to do that. It also takes, as you know, uh, negotiations or discussions with the federal government. Thank you. Moving on to Mike. Well, one of the things that uh, uh, the Conservatives would do is they would eliminate the Pacific Carbon Trust. The Pacific Carbon Trust is a organization that actually receives money from uh, educational institutions like schools uh, to uh, help uh, fund uh, corporate innovation in, uh, in terms of reducing emissions. So if we got rid of the Pacific Carbon Trust and we got rid of the carbon tax, we would not have to, uh, these educational institutions would have more resources to be able to invest in, into their students. So if we, when we are retire uh, as a generation, we uh, we will need students and workers with high paying jobs and good skills to su to support our retirement. So unless we invest in them, we're failing our own uh, future. Daylene. We have the worst student-teacher ratio uh, in Canada, so that's uh, great to know. Eh? The Pacific Carbon Trust that Mike was talking about uh, funnels about $10 million a year from schools and pretty much just gave it to corporations. We've had cuts in advanced education and innovation technologies of $46 million over the next three years. We have the highest student loan interest rates in Canada and we are going to leave our students with about $27,000 on average in debt. Um, that's of course low, it depends on what, what you're going to go into. My son wants to take a course and it's $31,000. I don't know too many 18, 19 year olds that can afford uh, payments which relate almost to being like a mortgage of $31,000 and up. If you're into medical like Mike is, man the sky's the limit and those kids are really going home with big, big loans, and that's what we need to do something about. I would like to see student interest rates uh, dropped, if not made zero. We are in the time right now when we have the lowest consumer interest rates, and I don't know why that's not being passed on to students. Thank you. 
Uh, moving on to transportation, since 2001, the population of Kelowna has jumped about 20%. And if you ever tried to drive down Harvey uh, on a Friday afternoon, I'm sure you know what we all mean. Do you have any plans to get more residents out of their cars and using public transit? And what would be the next priorities when it comes to highway spending? <laughs> well, I, I understand they have a, a new car share program in Kelowna, and I think that's an, an excellent initiative. Uh, that's uh, someone who has a, a passion for the environment and wants to make a difference by organizing an uh, entrepreneurial organization of a, uh, of, a, of a social enterprise organization to help people share their vehicles and get them out of their vehicles so they don't have to use vehicles and only use vehicles when they uh, have the need of one. So that kind of initiative is the sort of thing that, that uh, BC Conservatives want to support. We want to support people taking their own initiative to bring about uh, the reduction of emissions and to bring about uh, a better environment. That's, uh, that's our commitment. Aileen? Um, well, I've heard from a lot of people that if buses and transit was more convenient, then they would use it. So, you know, based on that, if we had more park and ride, then maybe people would uh, take the bus more often. It's unfortunate, but in our community, it is pretty spread out, and it is easier to take a car. Um, how do you get people into into the buses? It's it's like it's the most difficult thing to try and do. It's to break them the habit of of riding in a car. Uh, I think park and ride really is the best way to do that. And with students, they're saying that there needs to be more transit. There, they need to have improved times for pickup, later times. And kids are being passed by by transit buses that are going right by them that are full already. So obviously, we need to add more buses. Um, we just need to stop our dependency so much on the car, but I think that's going to be a tough one to shake. Tish? Well, I want to echo the appreciation uh, for the car share program. And also, uh, personally, I really like what the city has done with bike lanes. Um, I think that's great, and uh, I'm burning a lot of carbon now as a candidate, but I hope to get back on my bike uh, later. Um, we have made a commitment that we will take part of the carbon tax and put it toward transit. Uh, that's the key thing the province needs to do. And the other important component around transit, like a few other areas, there is a municipal planning component, and this is where the province really needs to work in solid partnership with municipalities so that the province isn't coming down and imposing, but the province puts forward something, works with the cities, the regional districts to make sure the transit plan is effective and then follows through to make the modifications as, as need be. I think there are people willing to get more out of their cars if we can accommodate that. And Steve? So um, we've, uh, and Cologne, as you know, is, is recognized as one of the uh, leading cities for its bike path and, and rails to trails network and connection. So we'll, we will continue to uh, support that. We recently announced uh, funding support for phase two of the rails to trails uh, route out to, out to UBCO, and we need to uh, work uh, collectively to complete uh, that process. Uh, in terms of transportation priorities, uh, the one of the key priorities will be to continue to work with the city and, and province in in the highway 33 uh, connection through to uh, uh, from Rutland through to downtown in the in the longer term uh, project connecting Rutland and the Rutland communities to to downtown more effectively uh, we've just announced the 50 million dollars for fixing up uh, or uh, six laning from highway 33 out to Edwards Road on highway 97 to increase the flow of uh, goods and, and services uh, along along the highway and transit it will continue to take uh, investment and support uh, but we need to make sure we do it in partnership and with a plan which in involves the educational institutions the city uh, the public and making sure that we create the connection particularly out of uh, out of clone emission into the uh, into the downtown connections because we do have the rapid bus service uh, coming from West Kelowna all the way out to UBC but we need to make sure we have effective connections for the clone emission riding into that uh, into that service for students uh, uh, in particular in Kelowna Mission. Thank you. Uh, we'll be moving into the economy next. This will be a two-part question. First of all, what do you see as weaknesses in our current economic climate? And then what do you see as potential avenues of economic growth in the region as well? And we'll start with Daylene. Well, we know that um, as far as fiscal management goes with the Liberals, we've had seven out of 12 years in office of deficits. 
Um, they're saying that our budget is balanced for 2013, and I think everybody can agree that it's anything but. I think it's just a matter of waiting to find out how bad it is. Is, is it as bad as the NDP says, or is it much worse? Um, I don't know, and it's, uh, it's very scary. When we, we looked at, in 2009, we were promised that we wouldn't have a deficit of more than $495 million, and it turned out to be over $2.8 billion, I believe, something like that. Um, and again, the, the Liberals have lied about the HST, and that's hurt, hurt us a lot. Um, their fiscal management hasn't been so good, and uh, I think they have a lot, of, a lot of things to answer for. There's a lot of unhappy people in this province, and, uh, and I'm one of them. So they better start answering some questions on, uh, on this balanced budget that we keep hearing so much about. Saying it a thousand times doesn't make it so. Tish? I think one of the weak – I mean, we've had some global economic issues for sure that we have to deal with. But I think there has been maybe a lack of faith in what we already have here in BC as we look at industry. And again, I go back to the notion of a sustainable economy. I go back to the notion of solid support for farming and agriculture, um, for pushing that we use the forest logs more and more for BC and lower the amount of raw logs that are going out. And again, that we have faith in a made in BC environmental system that we set processes in place with limits because we can work together to make a better British Columbia. And what seems to happen is we're farming things out to the federal government that should not go there. That was one of the problems with the HST. We gave away control of our provincial tax to the federal government. So really good environmental things like no tax on my bike when I bought it, we lost because we gave the control away. The people here can do it and so we have to have faith in them. That's our strength. Steve? So the strength of our economy is, is ensuring that we can continue to build on sustainable uh, resource development and create those long-term high-paying jobs that come from that and, and providing those opportunities through that process for, for First Nations. Uh, continuing to build on diversified uh, markets. I'd look uh, just at the example that we've had in the in the forest sector where we have taken uh, the market where we used to be primarily solely reliant on, on U.S. and have shifted it now to, uh, to China, for example, in the Asia-Pacific where we have increased export opportunities from uh, 67 million in 2001 uh, to over 1.2 billion in, in 2012. Uh, that's kept uh, people working in the industry, kept mills, uh, mills open. We need to continue to build that diversified economy, keeping taxes low for, uh, for both uh, individuals and for, uh, for businesses here in, uh, in the province, and making sure we have a, an environmental assessment process that uh, that, that uh, is respected and that people will work for. We do have that. Uh, what we are seeing now from the, uh, from the opposition in particular is a process now where they're making decisions uh, on resource projects and resource development even before they get into, uh, before it gets into that uh, process. And that doesn't send a very positive investment signal to, uh, to anybody uh, in British Columbia or, or internationally. Mike? The thing about the economy is that we need certainty. We need to have confidence that the future has a positive economic uh, um, plus for us. And so unless we, the businesses and the investment community have uh, a confidence in the future here in British Columbia, they're not going to uh, make that significant uh, investment in equipment and capital and facilities so that they have what is necessary to provide those high paying jobs. And right now we have both uh, the NDP, which are uh, projecting four years of de deficit spending, and the Liberals, who are putting conditions on the Northern Gateway pipeline that uh, have created a lot of uncertainty in our economy. And I think that's the number one issue that's uh, dragging down the economy is, is the fact that, that there's just no uh, certainty in terms of government. BC Conservative government would support a Northern Gateway pipeline. They would support uh, co the confidence that business needs to be able to invest in this province and provide those high paying jobs. Thank you. Can I rebut something that Steve just said? Go ahead. Um, the forest industry, we've lost uh, 70 mills and 30,000 jobs. How is it that the Liberals have been supporting that? You haven't even uh, did any measurements out in the forest, you have no idea what's out there. Um, 
there's there's a mill on the coast that's completely shut down, and yet their log decks are full of logs as they're being shipped out of the country. Um, I realize we can't stop all log exports, but increasing them is ridiculous. Uh, I've been told by the forestry workers that they would have to shut down 12 more mills in order to be sustained with what we have right now for wood. And yet you think the forest industry is doing well? Um, there's 30,000 people without jobs in the forest industry and 70 mills closed. How is that good? 30 well, second rebuttal. What we have done with it, in working with the industry is to build a diversified market for them that has kept uh, people working, kept mills uh, operating during probably one of the most uh, uh, downturns, one of the most significant serious downturns that the industry has faced with the collapse of the U.S. Uh, housing market. So building those diversified uh, markets is what's kept the industry working, kept people employed. Uh, the ability to export a portion of those uh, 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 logs uh, as uh, as logs is also uh, kept the full profile being harvested. That's kept people working on the coast. It's kept loggers logging and and uh, and truckers moving logs. Uh, the uh, just as uh, as uh, uh, the NDP and and Tish uh, indicated, there will there will need to be to continue to be uh, log exports in order to support the support the coastal log industry. We've recently made a number of changes to get more harvest available to the industry. The uh, Coastal Forest Products Association says that's going to create an additional 3,500 jobs on Vancouver Island and we'll continue to work with the industry to make sure we build that coastal uh, forest industry. All right, thank you. Moving on now to healthcare. It's safe to say that uh, people who come to Kelowna, some come to retire. That means that we have a significant seniors population that is growing. Now if elected, how does your party or if you're running as an independent, <laughs> plan to balance the growing pressure on health care costs along with the need to tighten overall spending by the government. Tish? Well, one of the initiatives that we've announced is to increase home support for seniors. And this is not only good with respect to care, but it's more efficient. Uh, we've already got uh, kind of a a musical bed game when it comes to services. You've got people in acute care who should be in more extended care. We've got on all the levels of beds and housing from assisted all the way through, we've got log jams that are hurting people and with hallway medicine. So when you provide the assistance to help people stay in their home, you are going to create efficiencies that are really important. Uh, we've also, with respect to some of the other services, and at all links, we're going to increase uh, child and youth mental health services outreach programs. Um, we are going to take a look so that we're not building hospital towers, but without a good plan for staffing. So again, and part of what we have to do is have a good talk with the stakeholders here. Thank you. Steve? So our, our despite the uh, the fiscal challenges that the that the province is facing, we're we're going to over the next three years add an additional 2.4 billion dollars to to the healthcare system. That's now increase, getting close to uh, to 50 percent of the of the provincial uh, budget. Uh, we will need to continue to work and ensure that uh, that the uh, Pro, the, the utilization of those uh, dollars is delivered in the most efficient uh, way possible. That's why we've had the process, and it's been a bipartisan process with the with the healthcare uh, standing committee on healthcare, looking at healthcare reform uh, that uh, um, Norm Letnick was chairing prior to uh, becoming minister of, uh, of agriculture. But there was a bipartisan group looking at all of that. They've completed the first phase of their report. Um, I expect that, they, that that process will continue into into phase two, looking at how we uh, how we reform uh, the delivery to make sure that uh, that we continue to utilize those dollars most efficiently, because we can't continue to just put additional uh, additional dollars to it on an ongoing uh, ongoing basis. Two point four billion dollars in the current fiscal climate is a significant uh, investment. We've got one hundred thirty two million dollars for the general practitioner. Uh, for me program uh, our platform calls for new hospice spaces and additional uh, support for addi addiction uh, uh, services in our uh, in the in the system and moving on to Mike yeah so uh, there's too much uh, money being spent in administration and uh, in, in the bureaucracy we need to move some of that money that is being spent in managing health care to the front lines uh, into the community uh, for example at our uh, in our uh, medical clinic, we have uh, a nurse practitioner and a nutritionist and a social worker, and they have, uh, they're have they funded by a program at the hospital called the Integrated Healthcare Network, and they work with the physician to increase the capacity of that physician to manage patients with complex care, 
chronic, ma uh, chronic disease management problems. So we need to, that's where the funding needs to go. We need to have it in the front lines, in the primary care area. We need more family doctors. We need more nurse practitioners. And we need to be able to build a team amongst allied health practitioners, including pharmacists, that will help serve our elderly community, our elderly population. And it's only by building that kind of capacity that we'll be able to provide the services for the uh, increasing aged population here in, in Kelowna. Dalene? We need to do a review of where our money's going. Uh, that's painfully obvious. Um, we're putting out an awful lot of money and don't seem to be getting a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, like Mike said, a lot of it's going in bureaucracy. It is absolutely being wasted. We have 20% of our acute care beds in BC being used for alternate care, like long-term care, home support and rehab and mental health issues. We need to help our, our seniors stay home longer and home support access has actually dropped by 30 percent in BC from 2001 to 2010 and I am an advocate and would like to um, for sure advocate for an independent uh, seniors advocate someone who does not report to the health minister but rather is completely independent so we can actually find out what's going on our health care is in crisis and we keep hearing that because that's the truth and the wait times for surgeries is unacceptable We've got doctors that are burned out, nurses burned out, uh, old hospitals and they're replacing, and we have new hospitals that have whole floors that don't even have beds on them. And we have uh, charities fundraising for MRIs and things like that that our tax dollars should have be fully paying for. Um, we are certainly in crisis in our health care and we need to address this. Thank you. Uh, I've been told we're running a little short on time, so this will be our final question. Uh, we always hear about the youth whenever there is an election. It's always about the youth vote and how they're disenfranchised with the political system. What is your response to those people who have never been to the polls before and how would you encourage them to exercise their right to vote? Steve? The, uh, it is a very important uh, component of our, our voting uh, base here in the, in, the, uh, in the riding and in the province, and, and you're right that uh, traditionally they, they haven't had the level of engagement or voting that uh, everybody would like to see. Uh, I think it's probably not just youth, but I think uh, the overall level of, uh, of voter engagement uh, at all levels uh, is something that uh, everybody would like to see, see improved. Uh, we were at the uh, Okanagan College Students Union uh, the other night where they've had an initiative to uh, to get people registered to vote, they, they set a target of getting a thousand students uh, registered. Exceeded that target, so it's uh, it's direct initiatives uh, that at that level that'll help get uh, youth engagement. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, in our uh, processes we're engaging youth, and we do that uh, with uh, with our teams. We do that with uh, uh, increasing use of uh, of social media and. Uh, if uh, as a as an older uh, person getting uh, getting used to social media now and things, it's uh, I know I've got a lot more work to do in that area in terms of uh, connecting uh, with youth in that in that process. But certainly something committed to do. Uh, but uh, and we need to make sure that we uh, as we're uh, as we're elected and, and um, successful in being being reelected uh, to be able to make sure that we continue to have those forums where we go out and talk to youth. We've I've done that through the process. Visited schools. Visited. Uh, um, university clubs, uh, visited classes, um, visited political clubs at school, so we'll need to continue to work in, uh, in, and make sure that uh, they understand the importance of their vote. Thank you, Steve. Moving on to Mike. Well, that's one of the reasons why I, I did my signing a little different uh, during this campaign. I have a, a sign that says, I like Mike. And it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and it relates to the whole uh, social media. In connecting through social media, engaging with your uh, politicians, your representatives, in a in a always on uh, instant engagement. So if somebody sends me uh, a Twitter message or Facebooks me or sends me an email or texts me, I'm able to respond in a quick like fashion. So we need to have that kind of engagement because the youth aren't going to wait for us to phone them back. They're not going to wait for us to if 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 they have a question, they need to be able to ask that question and they need to get some kind of a response from their politicians and from the people who represent them uh, in, a, in a timely fashion and so that's what we need we need to have that kind of connection in uh, with the youth people with the youth. Daylene? Well in Kelowna Mission we know that over 50 percent of the people didn't vote last time and um, you know I have two kids and they're pretty smart kids know when you're lying to them and it seems like the only time 
politicians ever want to talk to students is right around election time. And that needs to change. As being an independent candidate, what that means is that I am not bound by any sort of party policy, that uh, I am really just an advocate for my constituents. And that means that I can go into the legislature and I can argue what you want. And I am literally your voice. Um, I don't have party whips telling me what to say or how to, to vote or what to think um, like you find in the other parties. They actually have a person called a party whip. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. So they think that when a politician, a, a person that they know turns into a politician and they say suddenly they've changed. And it isn't necessarily that that person's changed. It's just they've gone into a system where they've, they're actually very ineffective because they can't speak. Um, and that's because of the party whip. And so I encourage everybody to go online and look up a documentary that just came out in the last week called Whipped. And I think that it'll really educate you on the political process here in British Columbia. And uh, I think you'll open your eyes and you really need to see it before you vote on the 14th. And Tish. One of the things the NDP has proposed as government is to lower voter registration, not the voting age, but registration to age 16. And one of my favorite parts in, in the campaigns that I've been is where we do get to go into schools and talk with kids. Um, they're, they're tremendous. And I think of how neat it would be if we could go into the high school, for example, and actually have the voter registration form so to catch on that enthusiasm that they show. I agree that there's a lot of voter cynicism around, and that's one of the reasons why we have that change for the better, one practical step at the time. That's why we're concerned about accountability. That's why we know that you're going to look hard at us, and as an MLA, we'll be having lots of interesting discussions because you will hold the government to account, and I want that to happen. We are being careful because we want to be clear that we make promises that we can deliver that we talk the talk and walk the walk. And I think in the long term, that's what voters want, is that we say what we mean and mean what we say. Thank you. Now we'll be wrapping up. Each candidate will be allowed one minute of closing remarks, starting with Steve. Thank you, and, uh, and thank you again to, uh, to Castanet for organizing this. Thank you to uh, everybody who's put questions in and everybody's watching, and thank you to the, to the fellow can uh, candidates uh, up here, uh, this is a, as you as you know, is a very very important election uh, coming up. The important uh, process will be to uh, to get out and um, and vote and and exercise your your right to to be able to do that. Um, I ha have over the last four years had the great honor of representing this riding. I feel that we've worked collectively to uh, to bring uh, benefits and services to the riding, uh, and and I look forward to continuing to do that. Uh, this is about a choice between a a government that is has demonstrated uh, and continues to demonstrate controlled spending, a balanced budget, a AAA credit rating, a plan for sustainable uh, resource development that's going to create the revenue and jobs that we need uh, uh, need for the future, uh, as opposed to one that is uh, projecting a continued deficit uh, funding, one that will put our credit rating at risk, and which costs us an additional $300 million if we lose uh, the AAA credit rating that we have. So I look uh, very much forward to, uh, uh, to continuing to work uh, for the people of this riding, um, ask for your support on May 14th and so uh, make sure that everybody uh, gets out and votes that's the uh, that's the key message thank you thank you very much Steve moving on to Tish we're ready to form a government that will be accountable and transparent one of the reasons why we posted the budget we have is because we want to be really blunt with you as honest as we can about what we truly believe is going on we have put forward a number of things that I've talked to. We've put forward a number of things in our platform. I encourage you to take a look at it and see that it's thought out. I, in my time in the NDP, have had the occasion to talk personally with Adrian Dix, with many of our other experienced caucus members. To some degree, we're a bunch of nerds, but I think that's kind of good because that means we want to get right down and dirty into the details. We care. We in the NDP have had powerful discussions sometimes. We're not afraid to have those discussions within the party and elsewhere because we know that we may disagree. But the bottom line is when people care passionately about this province, their voice deserves to be heard. And again, I have faith in the people of the province. I have faith in what you want to do, and I'm hoping you'll vote for us in May 14th in an events poll. Thank you, Tish. Daylene, closing remarks. The Liberals don't deserve another four years. They haven't respected your vote. 
The Premier has had three of her close staffers resign in disgrace in this past year, and they've become a scandal a day government and are an embarrassment to British Columbia. Our Premier has now the distinction of being the most unlike Premier ever, and now she's racing through red lights to impress her 11-year-old son. The same day that story broke, five people were killed because someone ran a red light. This is a government out of control. They think they're above the law, and they aren't accountable like you and me. The three local Liberal MLAs are set to get some gold-plated pensions if they win another term, and there's no gold-plated pensions for you. So don't give it to them. You deserve to be heard and to have someone strong enough and independent to be your voice, free of party rhetoric and whips. And I would be honoured to be that voice. And again, I'm asking you to please watch the documentary Whipped so that your democracy and your rights are upheld because you have no idea um, what it means to be NDP or not NDP, to be a, an independent candidate and what uh, that will do for you. You'll actually have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Daylene. Wrapping things up, Mike. So uh, the voters on the doorstep are telling me that uh, they are very cynical about government and politicians, yep. that uh, they don't feel like they have a voice, that uh, government MLAs are better at representing Victoria to Kelowna than they are Kelowna to Victoria. BC Conservatives, as a part of their constitution, they are fundamental about having their MLAs represent their constituents first before the party agenda. And so that's our commitment to British Columbia, is that we will represent our constituents and we will be your voice in Victoria. One aside, um, I am losing a lot of my I Like Mike signs <laughs> and, uh, and I know it's popular, it's a hot item here in Kelowna. And uh, so if you want a free sign, just give us a call at the office and we'll be happy to supply it to you. Thank you. All right, I want to thank all the candidates from Kelowna Mission for coming out this afternoon.